Okay, we're going to get started. Uh, I hope you're all doing well and welcome to my general plant identification and management webinar. So a brief introduction. Uh, my name is Ryan Gulick. I am the Terrestrial Invasive Species Project Manager with the Lower Hudson Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management, or the Lower Hudson PRISM for short. Uh, the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference is the host organization for the Lower Hudson Prism. I studied biology and environmental studies from the College of New Jersey, where I focused on invasive species and forest ecology. That's me here on the left. Uh, what you'll learn today is basic plant anatomy and how to distinguish one plant from another. Uh, I'll also be going over manual plant removal tools and techniques. So plant blindness, what is it? Well, it is the human tendency to ignore plants and their importance. Most people can't even tell the difference between two plants. Um, and why is this? Well, we have a visual preference for things that look similar to us. So as animals, we are much more easily uh, able to uh, tell two animals apart and, and um, key in on some specific uh, identification characteristics. Um, on top of that, most plants are green and they don't move. So people kind of just glaze over them as they're uh, walking along. So what's the issue with plant blindness? Well, first of all, plants are beautiful and awesome. If you're going for a hike and you're not appreciating the plants around you, you're missing a huge part of the experience of hiking. Um, it's also an environmental health issue. Uh, so if people are blind to plants, they're probably not so aware of invasive plants. And what it boils down to is that invasive plants uh, harm native plants. So if there are more invasive plants, there are less native plants. And native plants are the basis of the food chain. So more invasive plants means less native plants, means less everything else. Um, on top of that, 57-ish uh, uh, percent of endangered species are plants, but less than 5% of protection money is spent on protecting plants. Um, and so, it also means that there's less funding to research plants. And this is important for human health because plants can be very important medicine for us. Um, some would also argue that it's more ethical to do genetic research on plants than animals. And if you don't know how to identify different plants, you're probably not gonna know what the dangerous plants in your area are. Um, so, most people know what poison ivy is, uh, but there are a bunch of other plants out there that can hurt you if you uh, don't know what they are and you interact with them. So how do we overcome plant blindness? Well, it's got to be both a personal and a cultural shift. You, are all, you all are taking the first step today uh, and taking a general plant ID class, um, but instead of having so many animals as logos, uh, maybe we could have more plants as logos, and it uh, needs to be talked about more often how important plants are. Uh, plants could also be more involved in uh, photography and in modern art as well. All right, so let's hop into uh, how to identify a plant. My first question when I'm looking at a plant is, is it herbaceous or is it woody? And herbaceous plants will tend to be smaller. They'll have a green and flexible stem. Woody plants, on the other hand, are larger 
and they'll have gray or tan, brown, sometimes even red bark, um, and they have a rigid stem. And that rigid stem is what allows it uh, to get so tall. It has the structural capabilities to do so. Um, so it's not always very obvious. Um, some woody plants will have green stems when they're young, uh, and even when they're older, they might have green stems. Uh, so if you look on the right here, this is a common ornamental invasive used in landscaping. It's burning bush. Uh, it might be a little bit difficult to see, but uh, it's green um, when it's young. And even as it gets older, you can see a lot of green stem tissue here. Uh, so some tips for this is uh, feel the stem for rigidity. Um, so you're going to want to be gentle when you do this because plants can be pretty delicate, um, but that will give you a, a better idea if it's witty or herbaceous. Um, and the plant material that's closer to the ground is also older, so it's going to be more woody. So if you see on this sapling here, while it's green from this point up, you've got some uh, brown woody uh, material down here. Uh, so next I'm going to go over uh, some of the basic plant uh, groups and the first one is grass-like. Um, so these are all herbaceous and they can either be annual or perennial. Uh, so annual meaning that it grows and produces seed in the same year and then the plant dies uh, before the winter and comes back from seed in the next spring. Perennial meaning that some part of that plant, usually the roots, are going to survive over the winter and that plant is going to come back from uh, that living plant material the next spring. So the three general grass-like groups are grasses, sedges, and rushes. Grasses have hollow stems with nodes, sedges have edges, and rushes are round. Um, grass identification uh, is pretty difficult and tricky, uh, so I'm not going to go into any more detail than this. I just wanted you to be aware of the general categories of uh, what grass-like plants are. Okay, so the next category are forbs. Uh, these are herbaceous. Um, they are either annual or perennial, but they can also be biennial. And this means that the plant will grow one year, and then part of that plant will survive into the next year. And then on its second year of growing, that's when it's going to produce seed, and it's going to die after it produces seed. So the stems will be typically green and flexible, and they're going to be shorter than most other plants. Our next category are vines. Um, they can be either woody or herbaceous, and they're going to climb up anything that they can reach. Um, they're typically very fast growing, and they have uh, thin stems and branches. This is Virginia creeper here. You can see it growing right up this rock face. Okay, so our next category uh, is shrubs, and I'm going to talk about trees after. Uh, most people have an idea what the difference is between shrubs and trees, but it's really hard to pinpoint exactly what distinguishes them. Um, so shrubs are woody and perennial. They'll be shorter than trees and branchier than trees as well. Um, they're typically going to be pretty round in shape, uh, but one of the main differences between a shrub and a tree is that shrubs are multi-stemmed more than often than not. Uh, so trees, on the other hand, they're also woody and perennial, uh, but they're going to be much taller. Um, they'll be generally less branchy, and they'll have a single main stem uh, that the branches will come off of. Okay, so the next thing that I look at when I'm identifying plants is the branching pattern. Um, two of the most common are alternate and opposite. 
So here is an example of alternate leaves on the left. And you can see a leaf is coming out here from the branch. And then a little bit further up, a leaf comes out. Further up, a leaf comes out. As opposed to with opposite here on the right, uh, these leaves are coming out from the branch at the exact same spot along the stem. And it's important to know uh, that the difference between alternate and opposite because there are far fewer opposite plants than alternate. So if you're trying to identify a plant and you see that it has opposite leaves, um, it really narrows down what it could be. So a, a little acronym uh, that you could try to remember is MADCAP. Um, it's not all-inclusive, uh, but MAD stands for maple, ash, and dogwood, and Caprifoliaceae is a family that includes viburnums and honeysuckles. So these are all opposite plants that you'll find around here. So two other branching patterns that we have are world and basal. Um, so world will be arranged in a circle along the stem, like you can see with this gallium here on the left. And basal, uh, the plant will have leaves that come right out of the ground, uh, have leaves along the stem. Uh, and everybody's familiar with a common dandelion. Uh, dandelion has basal leaves. Okay, so our next thing that we're gonna look for is what is the leaf structure? Um, so to look at this, we're gonna look at how a leaf comes off of, uh, of the petiole. And the petiole is this, this little uh, structure here that attaches a leaf to the stem. Uh, so this is spicebush, one of my favorite native shrubs. It smells amazing, um, and it has simple leaves. It has one leaf that comes off of the petiole. The next one uh, is compound. This also has one leaf per petiole, but it will have multiple leaflets per petiole. So this whole thing here, this is all one leaf. All seven of these leaflets, that comprises one leaf. Um, so when you're looking at a tree and it has compound leaves, and something that will help you identify is counting how many leaflets uh, one leaf has. Uh, this will generally be a range, like five to seven. Um, so sometimes there might be some overlap and it won't be the best thing to identify something, but it'll, it'll give you a hint. Um, and in the autumn, this whole leaf will fall. The individual leaflets won't fall off. The whole leaf will fall. So if you look on the ground at the leaves that have fallen, and you see um, a compound leaf, this whole thing, uh, you know that there's a tree around that has compound leaves. Now I want to make an important distinction here. Um, the leaf structure being compound, some might think that because these leaflets are coming out opposite of each other, that this has opposite branching pattern, where that is not the case. Um, so here you can see a compound uh, leaf uh, on the top that has opposite branching pattern. These compound leaves are coming out opposite on the stem. And on the bottom you can see uh, compound leaves that have alternate branching pattern. So just because these leaflets come out opposite of each other does not mean it has opposite branching pattern. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about leaf shapes. Uh, there are so many different leaf shapes, um, but I'm gonna go over a few of the most common ones. So the first one is ovate, uh, which means egg-shaped, and it helps me to remember it as oval. Um, so spice bush again, 
uh, simple leaf and alternate branching. It has ovate shaped leaves. Uh, the next one is lancelet. These are long and narrow, typical of a willow tree. Uh, it helps me to remember of lances, you know, jousting in medieval times. That, that helps me remember the uh, leaf shape of lancelet. Uh, next we have deltoid. Um, and these are triangular in shape. Uh, so if anybody's familiar with the uh, symbol uh, delta, um, delta is a triangle, deltoid leaf shape has triangle shaped leaves. So this is a mile a minute vine here. Again, this has um, alternate branching pattern and simple leaves that are deltoid in shape. Next, we'll have orbicular. Uh, this means round. Uh, it says orb right there at the beginning, helps me to think of orbs. Uh, so this right here is oriental bittersweet. It has these very round leaves. Again, they're simple and alternate. Okay, so next we have chordate. I don't have any uh, fun way to try and remember that. It's just heart-shaped. Um, so here we have a linden tree or basswood. And you can see up here near the petiole, uh, this leaf has an indent on both sides that make it look like a heart. And the last leaf shape I'll tell you about is palmate. And these are hand-shaped like your palm. Uh, and these leaves are lobed, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Okay, so along with um, the shape of the leaf, you're also going to want to look at the edge of the leaf. And first I'll talk about lobes. So these are deep indentations on the edge of your leaf. Um, so for identifying something, you'll want to look at how many lobes does this leaf, leaf have? How deeply is it lobed? And what are the shape of these lobes? So here we have two different species of oak trees that have different shape lobes. So on here on the left, these lobes are very pointy. Here on the right, these lobes are round. You're also going to want to look at serration on the leaf margin or edge. Um, so you'll want to look at the shape of the serration. So if you can see here in the middle, this has got a pretty pointy serration. And here on the bottom left, it's got a very round serration. You'll want to look at the size of the serration as well. And if something is not serrated, that is called entire. It has an entire leaf margin, uh, like this leaf here on the right. Okay, so flowers will also be a pretty big hint for you uh, when you're identifying plants. Um, and obviously flowers are not always in bloom, so this is not something that you're gonna wanna depend on, uh, but it can really help you if a plant is in bloom, determining what it is. So the first and most obvious thing you're gonna look for is color. Um, but then you're also going to want to see how are these flowers arranged. Um, here we have a tulip tree. This is a single flower. Uh, tulip tree is one of my favorite trees. It's native and the flowers are awesome. Uh, it's got this really cool and unique leaf shape here too. Um, so the plant could also be clustered. Uh, this is a native viburnum here with a cluster of flowers. Um, that shape right there is also called an umbel. Or you could have catkin flowers, which are these long droopy flowers here. Uh, and that uh, helps me remember like a cattail, catkin with that long droopy uh, arrangement there. So something that'll also help you identify if there are flowers is 
uh, noting when it's blooming. Different uh, plants will bloom at different times, um, so the time of year that it's blooming will, will really help you. Uh, and you could also count how many petals a flower has. And probably the most important for overall context when you're identifying a plant is where is it growing? Is it wet or dry, sunny or shady? What's the elevation? And uh, how disturbed is the area? How much human influence is there? Um, so a lot of disturbed areas will have quite a few invasive plants, whereas um, undisturbed, very natural areas will have more native plants. And lastly, you're gonna wanna look for some unique characteristics. And this is gonna be anything that stands out to you. What makes this plant pop? Um, on the left here, we have shag bark hickory. Uh, that has bark that is really peely. Uh, I, I, there are no other trees in the area that, that really have that, that peely bark like that in the same fashion that shag bark hickory does. And on the right here, um, I was doing some field work last year, and this plant has thorns that are as long as my index finger. So I just, I had to snag a picture of it. That's a pretty unique characteristic there. Um, some plants will also have a smell that might help you identify it. Um, and the leaf texture as well can really help. Uh, so it could be, you know, waxy or fuzzy. Um, but I, I would just err on the side of caution when using leaf texture to identify something. Because if you don't know what the dangerous plants are in the area, you really don't want to be touching any plants. Uh, because if you touch the wrong plant, you could get pretty hurt. So as an overview of general plant ID, you're going to want to think, is it woody or herbaceous? What type of plant is it? What kind of branching pattern does it have? or opposite, world or basil? What do the leaves look like? What shape are they? What does the leaf margin look like? What are the flowers like? Where is it growing? And what kind of unique characteristics does it have? So I have some tips for you. Um, my first tip would be start with the common plants in the area. And you could research this beforehand. Uh, think about common trees like maples and oaks, uh, ashes. Um, you know, there are different species of these trees that uh, you're probably already pretty familiar with the general shape of the leaf um, that you could uh, be able to identify them uh, more easily than some of the plants that you're less familiar with. You're going to want to identify um, plants that are typical. You don't want to identify something that's been munched on by a deer or uh, insects. You don't want to identify something that is diseased by a fungi or, or bacteria. You don't want to identify something that is withering. You want to identify something that is robust and typical looking. Um, I'd really encourage you to get and use a field guide when you're identifying plants. And this can be kind of a uh, tricky hurdle to get over. There's a bit of a steep learning curve with a field guide. But if you start with plants that you already know and just go through the field guide, uh, a lot of them have dichotomous keys where you choose one option or another, and it'll lead you to another place where you'll have one option or another. Uh, so if you start with plants that you know, uh, you'll become familiar with the language that's used in these field guides, and it'll make it much easier for you to identify uh, some of the more tricky plants. 
practice, practice, practice. You'll practice alone with another learner or with somebody that already has some plant ID skills. The more you're out there doing it, and the more often you're out there doing it, the easier it will become. And some plants will just become like facial recognition for you. You'll see a plant and you'll be like, oh, I know that's a viburnum, or I know that's an oak. Um, and so another tip is to take multiple pictures. If you're unsure of the ID of something and you want help, um, don't just take one picture 10 feet away, it's a little bit blurry. Uh, if you showed me that picture, I probably wouldn't be able to identify it for you. You really need to get in there close and take pictures of the leaves. Try and get both the top and the bottom of the leaf. Um, take picture of the bark and, and what the buds look like, the flowers. Everything that you can get a picture of will help with identification. And lastly, um, I would say that you should use apps to confirm ID. Uh, so there's some great apps out there, I'll talk about them in a minute, that help you identify plants. You basically just point your phone at it, take a picture, and it could tell you pretty much uh, what it is. Um, but if you go out into the field and you rely on these apps from the get-go, you're not gonna build those skills and remember these questions that you should be asking yourself when you're identifying a plant. And if there's a plant that the app doesn't know how to identify, um, then you're kind of out of luck if you haven't practiced uh, your plant ID skills. Okay, so some resources here. Um, the apps that I were talking about, um, they're Seek and iNaturalist. Uh, we actually just posted tutorials for these apps on YouTube. Um, Seek is great because you basically, it works in real time and you point your camera at something, you don't even have to take a picture, um, and you can move your camera around, and as you move your camera and you get a good angle on this plant, um, it'll hone in on what it thinks that identification is. Um, iNaturalist is great because you can take and upload multiple pictures, and it'll suggest an ID to you, but if it's not sure and you're not sure, there's a whole community of um, botanists and uh, people that like plants as a hobby, uh, people that will be able to see your entry and help confirm an identification or suggest something else. Um, so two really common field guides are Newcombs and Petersons. Um, again, I, I highly recommend that if you're going to get into plant identification that you get a field guide. Um, you could also talk to your local land managers. If you have a plant that you don't know how to identify and it was in their preserve, uh, they probably know what it is. They probably even know where it is. Um, and, you know, you might ask them to go on a plant walk with you. They, they might be more than happy to, to organize something uh, if people ask for it. Um, and then you're going to want to think about what are the nonprofits, companies, and government agencies around me that could help as well. Um, so the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference offers trainings that you could attend like this one. Um, and the Cornell Cooperative Extension and the Natural Heritage Program are also two uh, great resources for native plants. Okay, so I've mentioned dangerous plants a few times in this webinar. Uh, pictured here is poison ivy. I didn't put pictures of all of the other plants. I just wanted you to be aware of them. Um, so that you can look into them on your own time before you go uh, touching any plants. 
Um, so Poison Ivy, everybody's familiar with. We've also got Poison Sumac, Giant Hogweed, Cow Parsnip, Wild Parsnip, and Stinging Nettle. Um, some of these are more dangerous than others. Um, stinging Nettle, you know, that causes you some irritation. Poison Ivy and Sumac depends on the person, but you just get a little rash. Um, but these plants here, Parsnip and Hogweed, um, can cause some pretty serious burns if you touch them. Um, so I definitely would recommend that you guys uh, look into what these plants are and how to avoid them. Okay, so next we're going to talk about um, manual plant removal. Um, and this is great for you to know, um, you know, both in garden settings, on your own property, if you have um, any plants growing in a wooded area on your property uh, that you're wanting to get rid of, uh, or if you're looking to do some invasive species management. So manual plant removal can take years uh, and requires a lot of hard work and persistence, but it's also extremely satisfying. Um, there is an obvious physical change that you can see at the end of the day. That's satisfying, but even more satisfying than that is when you finally get this plant completely under control and it doesn't grow back anymore. So it's important for you to know that there are different best management practices for different plants um, and that plants are pretty well known for being able to uh, regrow um, from either roots that are left behind or uh, you know even stems that are left behind can reroot and grow a new plant. So because of that you're going to want to remove especially as much of the root as possible um, but as much of the, the whole plant as possible. And it's really important that you remove the plant before it goes to seed. Um, if you're in there and you're doing management while it's in seed, a lot of those seeds are gonna fall and seedlings are gonna pop up. Uh, and that's just, you, you just don't want that. It'll make more work for you in the long run. Um, so iNaturalist, um, the app that I was talking about, you could also go on your computer and go on their website. Um, they have a phenology tool. Um, so it'll tell you when people have observed it, when it had just leaves, when people observed it where it had flowers, and when it had fruit as well. Um, so that's a, a very, very good tool that you could use to see when a plant is going to be in seed. Okay, so the number one thing is safety. You know, this goes with any physical labor. It's no different than uh, with plant management. Um, so here we actually have one of those dangerous plants. This is giant hogweed. Um, so the sap can burn you if it gets on your skin. So you can see a core member from last year covered head to toe. Uh, to be safe when managing this plant. So no plant is worth getting hurt over. You know your abilities and you know your limitations. If there's a plant on a steep slope and you don't have the best balance, it's probably not a good idea to try and manage it. I'd always advise you to carry a first aid kit, um, even if you're close to your house, but especially if you're hiking in the woods. Um, it's always a good idea as well to tell somebody your plan, where you're going, and when you're going to be back. Uh, bring plenty of food and water. Definitely bring more water than you need, and I always recommend snacks. Um, you're going to want to use tools as they're intended. If you use a tool in a way that it's not intended, there are a few different outcomes. You could either break the tool, um, you could hurt yourself, 
or you're going to make the job harder for you than it could be. And some personal protective equipment that you're going to want to wear are sturdy boots, long pants, eye protection, gloves, and if you're using any tool that you're going to be swinging around, I'd also recommend a hard hat. Um, a lot of people think that wearing eye protection um, is less important. People are, can, can tend to be a little bit relaxed about wearing eye protection. Um, but when you're managing plants, there's going to be dirt flying around and twigs hitting you in the face. Uh, and I've actually seen somebody firsthand just walking in the woods, uh, stepped on a stick, it bounced up and hit him in the eye and scratched his cornea. So definitely want to emphasize that eye protection is very important for plant management. So some preparation for plant management. Um, you're going to want to know what's your goal. Are you removing the plant just because you don't want it there? Um, are you planning on doing restoration work there? Because um, then you got to think about, am I going to be planting native plants? Um, you're also going to want to know your target. Are you targeting just one plant? Are you targeting multiple plants but one species? Are you targeting multiple species in an area? If you don't own the land, you're going to have to get permission. Um, so it's always a good idea to scout the area beforehand and set up work boundaries. This gives you a clear idea of where you're working. It gives you a tangible goal and it really helps uh, methodically go through the boundary area and get every single plant that's in there. You're going to want to do some research and know what the best management practices are for plants. Some plants, you really do not want to cut them. If you cut them, they act like hydras and they send up three or four in their place. And that'll make it a lot more difficult for you in the future. You'll want to plan for plant material disposal as well. And I'll talk about that more a little later. Um, definitely check the weather before you go out. Uh, you're not going to want to be out there if it's downpouring or extremely hot. Um, and you're also going to want to consider the effects of your removal. If you're on a hillside and you're ripping plants out of the ground, uh, you might be increasing erosion. Um, so that soil that's now loose because you were ripping plants out of the ground, uh, that might be washed away in the rain. Um, you're also just going to want to bring a lot of gear. As much gear as you can bring, um, you know, it's always better to be overprepared than underprepared. Uh, there's been uh, far too many times where uh, I've forgotten the one tool that I need and had to go back and pick it up or make do with what I had. Okay, so if you're doing any sort of invasive removals, um, I always would like to, uh, I'd, I'd highly recommend that you collect data as well. Um, this data is very important for plant managers like myself uh, in making management decisions. Um, so the minimum data that you should record if you're going to is the date, the location, and the GPS coordinate is the best here. What is the species that you're managing? What methods you've used? Um, the number of plants removed, if possible. And what is the area uh, in square feet or, or meters or acres that you managed? So some tools for the job. If you're taking data, paper and pencil. Um, flagging material is great for establishing boundaries. And a tarp is great for uh, moving around plant material and piling it up. Um, so shovels, hand trowels, soil knives, 
and pickmatics are the tools that you'll want to consider if you're digging up a plant. Weed wrenches, um, that's more of a pull-up kind of tool. Um, they're a bit cumbersome, uh, but they are extremely effective. Hand saws, pruners, loppers, and mowers or weed whackers are going to be uh, the tools that you're going to want to use if you're cutting a plant. So some of the methods here. Uh, the easiest in most cases is going to be pull up. Um, you're going to want to grasp the plant firmly at the base. I, uh, there have been a uh, couple times where um, I've seen people try and grab the plant at the top or in the middle, um, and then they end up snapping the plant and, and making it much more difficult to pull. Um, so you're going to want to pull perpendicular from the ground or whatever way that plant is growing. So if it's not growing straight up out of the ground, uh, but it's growing a little bit crooked, um, that's probably the way that you're going to want to pull this plant. You're going to want to start pulling gently and increase your pressure. If you just go uh, all at once and use all your force, uh, you're probably going to snap that plant and it'll be impossible to get out unless you dig out the roots. You can wiggle the plant a little bit back and forth while you're pulling to loosen the soil. And it's easiest to do after a rain uh, when the soil's wet. This is going to be pretty difficult to do in rocky soil. Uh, if you can't pull it by yourself, try a two, three, even four person pull. Um, this picture on the right here is me and two of my crew members last year. Uh, this plant, Scotch broom here, I was trying to pull it myself. And then I called Jackie over and I asked her to help and the two of us were trying to pull it. And then I called Chris over and finally after five minutes of trying to get this plant out of the ground uh, with three people pulling on it, we got it out and we were just ecstatic. <laughs> it was a great moment. Uh, weed wrenches I mentioned earlier. Um, these are great for medium-sized shrubs and trees that you want to take out of the ground. Um, again, they're large and cumbersome, uh, but they, they're really great for uh, using uh, leverage to get plants out of the ground. Uh, so the dig up method is going to be great for getting most of the roots out of there. The pickmatic is my favorite tool for this uh, method. Uh, pickmatics have one sharp pointy end and they have a flat pointy end on the other side and that flat end is great for digging uh, and the pointy end is great for uh, getting the tool underneath the plant so that you could leverage it up. Uh, sharp tools are going to be your friend here and it's important to know that the roots will extend well past the stem. Um, so I'd advise that you loosen the soil at least three to six inches around the plant uh, to try and get as much of that root as possible. But it's going to depend on what plant you're managing. Um, and so this method, after you loosen the soil, you might not have to use your, your shovel anymore. You, you could probably just pull it out. Okay, so next we have a cut only method. Um, so for this one, you're going to want to cut the plant at soil level. Mowing or weed whacking will work too, uh, more for the herbaceous species than the woody species. You're going to want to wait for the plant to flower or pull it just before, but definitely before the plant seeds. Um, Again, this is so that the seeds don't get into the soil. But on top of that, the longer you wait before you um, cut this plant, the more energy that the roots are using to produce that plant. So the longer you wait, the more energy the roots are using 
And your goal with cut only is to exhaust the roots. You want to get all the energy out of them. So, um, you know, this could take many years because the plants are most likely going to re-sprout. But it could be your only option in rocky soil. Now, I haven't used them myself, um, and I haven't talked to anybody that has used them, uh, but there is a new management option out there for the cut-only method. Um, they're called buckthorn bags, and they're basically little black bags that you put over the stump of a tree after you cut it, and supposedly that suffocates the plant and will uh, greatly improve your management. So if anybody does try out buckthorn bags or anything like that, uh, please reach out, let me know how it goes. Okay, so the next thing you could do is girdle the tree. Um, so this is gonna be uh, primarily for tree management. And what that girdling does is it stops the transfer of nutrients and water between the roots and the leaves. So what you're gonna wanna do is make a shallow cut around the circumference of the tree. You don't wanna leave any gaps. You wanna make sure that that circle is complete. Um, the depth of your circle, uh, the depth of your cut, is going to want to uh, depend on how thick the bark is on the tree that you're managing. A lot of people will recommend a double girdle, like you can see in this picture here. And if the tree isn't going to fall on anything, you're not concerned about where it falls, um, try and leave it standing if possible. Um, dead trees are great habitat um, for all sorts of different woodland critters. Uh, something else that you could do is smother or solarize plants. Uh, so for this, you're going to want to cut the plants low to the ground. And if you have access to it, you'll want to saturate the soil with water. Um, this will help get all the air out of the uh, soil and uh, improve your effectiveness. You'll want to cover the area with plastic or cardboard. Um, and plastic probably works a little bit better, um, but I advocate more for cardboard because uh, plastic will become brittle over age and it'll be hard to remove it. Or if you forget, to go back and remove your uh, barrier, um, then there's less plastic being littered into the environment. So you're gonna wanna secure your perimeters with rocks or stakes. Yeah, um, and if this is not very secure, um, those plants might just grow out the side of your barrier. Uh, it'll basically be for nothing. Um, and then after you've covered it, and secured it, you're going to want to put a foot or two of mulch or soil on top. Um, so it's pretty important that you monitor uh, this for holes because if a uh, plant breaks through, uh, you're going to want to replace your barrier. So what do you do when you're done with management? Well, for one, you're gonna to wanna to monitor your sites often, definitely at least once a year, uh, but more often if you have the time. So some options for disposal of your plant material. And basically what you're trying to do here is completely incapacitate this plant, make it unable to produce any seeds. So one option is that you can double bag it and throw it out. You could also double bag it and then leave it out in the sun for a few days, and then you could compost that material. You could use a wood chipper, um, or you could dry out the plant by hanging it in branches of trees nearby. Now this is probably better for if you're just doing a small project because you don't want uh, little shrubs hanging in every single tree in the forest. 
Uh, lastly, you could make a pile, preferably on a rock with sun exposure. Um, if a plant has contact with the soil, it's probably going to reroot. Um, so if you don't have a rock nearby with sun exposure, um, definitely try and just make that pile as compact as possible so that you know where to check for regrowth the next year. If you recorded data, you're going to want to enter it on either imapinvasives.org or inaturalist.org. And probably the most important thing is replant with native plants if possible. Um, this will both help with uh, your management in the future because the native plants will be competing with the invasive plants or the undesirable plants. Um, and it's great for the environment as well. So some tips for you for management. Um, if you've got the time, flag the plants. Um, this will make it much easier, especially if you're bringing along volunteers um, to spot the plants that you're trying to get out of there. This is going to be the easiest to do in the spring and the fall when the soil is moist. You're going to want to work from the edge towards the center. Um, so this will help you with getting all of the plants that are in your work area, uh, but also if uh, you don't get the center, um, then it reduces the area that those seeds are going to spread next year. A little suppression and uh, containment there. Um, so you can clip some troublesome branches before digging. Uh, this is especially useful if you're digging up um, things with thorns like barberry or multiflora rose. And this here on the right is a picture of barberry that's been uh, clipped up with loppers before uh, we use the pick to dig it out of the ground. Um, if you do plant native plants, um, you're going to want to protect them from herbivory. Um, so deer, if you don't protect your plants, will just come along and munch that right up and you won't have a plant anymore. Um, so there are tree tubes you can buy, um, there's deer resistant spray uh, that you could buy. Um, with the deer spray, you're going to have to go back and reapply um, you know, pretty often, uh, but it is a, a tool at your disposal. Uh, you could also put up fencing around the plants, around the whole area if you want. Um, you're going to want to take breaks pretty often. Uh, you know, plant removal can be pretty exhausting work. It's also pretty repetitive. Um, so take a, a five minute break and get some water pretty often. And it's always nice if you have headphones. You could listen to a podcast uh, or some music. Um, and if you're using headphones, you're not disturbing anybody else that might be around you. Uh, but if you do use headphones, since you're going to be uh, in a natural area, I would advise that you only put one headphone in so you can be more aware of your surroundings. And with that, um, I have a few minutes for any questions. Um, this presentation was made possible through funds from the Environmental Protection Fund, which is administered by the New York State uh, Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, so I'll go through the chat and look for any questions. And if I don't have time to get to yours, uh, you could email me your questions at rgulick at nynjtc.org.
Yeah, so Kate G asked if there was a listing somewhere with most uh, common invasives in New York City and lower New York area. Um, there are common widespread invasives. Uh, you can check on the Lower Hudson Prism uh, website um, and we have a ranking system. So anything that's tier four will be widespread and you're going to see those more often than not. <laughs> Best way to get rid of Barbary, uh, get in there and dig it up. Yes, there is giant hogweed and parsnip in our area. Um, the DEC has a program uh, specifically for giant hogweed. There's actually a giant hogweed hotline, um, <laughs> which I think is awesome and also kind of amusing. Uh, we manage some sites for them every year. Yes, this webinar is being recorded and uh, it will be available uh, online at a later date. We'll get it up as soon as possible. Helen said she hadn't found good apps yet. Um, like I mentioned before, uh, definitely be looking for Seek and iNaturalist. Those are my two favorite. Uh, Doug asked, a good field guide for the New Jersey, New York answer. I agree with Tom. Uh, Peterson's field guide to Eastern trees is very good. Um, there are a lot of emerging invasives in the area uh, that I'm concerned could be a big problem. Um, all of them pretty much. Uh, the, the reason that we work with emerging invasives is that we're trying to stop them from becoming as widespread as things like burning bush and barberry um, and multiflora rose. Um, I'll email the participants the link um, and then it'll be available uh, probably on our YouTube, uh, but I'll email everybody the link to the presentation. Uh, yeah, I'll probably be doing um, follow-up sessions for uh, more specific um, and more advanced uh, details on ID and management. Um, I'm actually going to be working on short ID videos for all of the emerging invasive species that we're dealing with. Yes, again, um, to Larry, there are high priority invasives. If you go on um, Lower Hudson Prism's website, uh, and you look at our species categorization, anything that's tier two are emerging invasives, and those are our priority. All right, everybody, we are out of time. Thank you so much for coming. I hope you enjoyed and have a great day.